star in the sky, your light shining Through the dark of the night, Jesus forever I find all that I am in your love, love, love You are with me in every step that I take in love for me You have called me by name, Jesus forever And I'm Clement. Welcome back to The Evolution Online. If you're one of our peeps who couldn't make it to church in person, please know that you are really missed. And if you're new here, man, we're so excited for you. Yes, one of the things our faith teaches us is that for one day a week, it's so important to come together to be with God and be with each other. That's right. Having one day where we stop everything to worship, to be in God's presence and connect to Him and each other, there is nothing like it. I totally know what you mean. A couple of months last year, my job kept me away from gatherings and it was so tough. Yep. But we don't meet just because we're commanded to. We meet together because it's good for us. That's right. So if you're watching this online, awesome! It's such a great way to connect during this challenging season. But when you can, we want to encourage you to be with a community in person. Whether it's our Evolution Fam or a community you can get to. We have live gatherings every Sundays, 2-4pm to 4 PM at our church. Drop in our website for directions or just DM us and we'll be happy to help you out. That's right. And in the meanwhile, give us a follow on Instagram at The Evolution Fam yep. and at The Evolution Youth. That's where our church does most of our updates and you get a taste of what we're like and never miss the latest happenings or the latest things that we are putting up. Yes. Awesome. So one last thing before we get to the message. Giving time! Scan the QR code below or head to theevolution.org slash give if you're our friend, don't feel obligated. Only give if you feel moved to. We believe giving is worship and all must be done 
from a willing and cheerful heart. If you remember, we are praying that as you give, God will be doing something in your heart and in your capacity as a person. Yes. So ready to get your hearts transformed? You're going to be hearing a message of one of our senior leaders, Regina Lu. She's a pillar of wisdom and always communicates life and character with depth and simplicity. You're going to love it. Here's the message. And today I'll be wrapping up the series We Are Here by talking about lessons from Moses. So Moses was a prophet who led the Israelites, God's people, out of slavery in Egypt towards the Promised Land. You know, his life was pretty dramatic, eventful, and it definitely made the whole te Old Testament a whole lot more interesting. You know, but more than that, Moses and the Israelite story was one that depicts God's grace for humanity despite our shortcomings. And a picture of how an intimate relationship with God could look like as we read more about Moses speaking to God face to face. So before we dive deep into the message, I thought that it would be helpful to give everyone a quick overview of Moses' life, okay? So Moses, he was born in Egypt at a time where the Israelites were enslaved by the e Egyptians. So Pharaoh, the ruler of Egypt, had ordered for all Israelite ba male babies to be drowned in the Nile River. Thankfully, Moses was rescued by Pharaoh's daughter and he grew up in the Egyptian palace. So one day, when Moses was an adult, he witnessed an Egyptian being beaten up by one of the Is beating up an Israelite slave. So he killed the Egyptian and he ran away when Pharaoh found out about it. So he fled and he settled down the land of Midian where he got married, became a shepherd, helping his father-in-law tend to sheep. And it was only 40 years later when God called Moses through a burning bush to lead the Israelite out of slavery in Egypt. However, because of Israelites' disobedience to God, instead of 11 days, they spent 40 years wandering in the wilderness before entering the Promised Land. And at the end of Moses' life, God directed Moses to Mount Nebo to see the Promised Land, and then he died. So the ending was kind of bittersweet, no? You know, Moses saw the Promised Land, you know, but he did not leave to enter it. You know, one could argue that Moses failed to, failed to leave out his calling, but from my perspective, you know, Moses did. Yeah. You see, our calling is not a destination. It's not an outcome. Rather, it's a process and journey of becoming. You know, each time God calls and we respond, you know, we are living into the calling God has for us yeah. as individuals and as community. The only time we stop living out our calling is when we stop responding to God's call. You know, so there are so many lessons we could draw from Moses and how he responded to God each time. And I want to share three points on how we as a community can learn from him in our response. All right, first point, letting go the things of this world and self. So let's turn our Bibles to Exodus chapter 3, verse 1 to 6, all right? So the CV version, so if you have a Bible, you can flip to there. I'll give you some time. Exodus chapter 3. So if you're there, you can say yes. Amen. Yes. All right. So Moses was taking care of the flock for his father-in-law, Jethro, the Median's priest. He led his flock out to the edge of the desert and he came to God's mountain called Horeb. The Lord's messenger appeared to him in a flame of fire in the middle of a bush. So Moses saw that the bush was in flames, but it didn't burn up. Then Moses said to himself, hmm, let me check out this amazing sight and find out why the bush isn't burning up. So when the Lord saw that he was coming to look, you know, God called out to Moses and said, Moses, Moses. And Moses replied, I'm here. Then the Lord said, don't come any closer. Take off your sandals because you are standing on holy ground. So, and after that, God continued, I am the God of your father, Abraham's God, Isaac's God, Jacob's God. And Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. So this was Moses' first encounter with God. You know, he was helping his father-in-law to take care of the sheep, you know, when he saw the burning bush. So he was in the desert. So burning bushes was actually not an uncommon sight back then. But what was fascinating was the bush continued to burn. So out of curiosity, you know, Moses went closer. 
So usually, you know, when two people meet for the first time, you know, they will start off the conversation by greeting each other, you know, and introducing their names. Say, hey, I'm Regina. Oh, you're Cindy. Nice to meet you, right? But the interesting thing here is that before God revealed who he was, he told Moses to stop and take off his sandals. So verse 5 says, Then the Lord said, Don't come any closer. Take off your sandals because you are standing on holy ground. He continued, I am the God of your father, Abraham's God, Isaac's God, and Jacob's God. So it got me wondering, you know, why did God ask Moses to take off his sandals? You know, so one interpretation was that back in those days, you know, when someone wanted to transfer his property to another person, they would perform the ritual of removing their shoes. So you see, the act of removing one's shoes actually signified that the person has willingly divest the property and officially relinquish all future claims to the property. So similarly, you know, when God told Moses to remove his sandals upon entering sacred ground, you know, we could interpret that the act of removing one's shoes symbolizes the temporary divesting of oneself, of the world, and its way in exchange for a spiritual residence. Wow. You know, and it points us to a simple revelation. That is, for God to reveal himself to us, we first got to let go the things of this world. You see, many times, you know, we fall short of finding God's call in our lives because we stop at the miracle. You see, the burning bush symbolizes miracles in our life. You know, we want God's blessing, but we're not willing to remove our shoes and give out certain things in our life in order to know and follow God. You know, let's be real here. You know, many of us, when we first become a Christian, you know, because we, we first become Christian because of God's blessing in our life. You know, it's great to receive God's love, you know, to know that He has a great plan for us and to experience miracles. But few of us transit to knowing God in a deeper way that goes beyond the blessings. And that's why, you know, when things don't pan out the way we want, you know, when life throws us crap, you know, we, <laughs> we fall away from God. <laughs> So friend, if I can be brutally honest with you, I have never met someone who knows God in a deep and authentic way that has never given up something in their life. You see, knowing God in a deeper way requires some form of sacrifice. You know, I remember as a youth growing up, you know, while all our friends were out and about playing at the arcade, you know, hanging out at shopping malls. You know, Rebecca, Carries, and myself, you know, we would travel to each other's house after school and we would spend hours praying and worshipping. You know, so back then, right, we didn't have MP3 player, you know, so all we had was just this huge CD player. So we put in the CD and then we just loop it over and over and over again for so many times, you know. And, but the thing I remember most vividly about is that God would speak to us so clearly and so powerful and we would see so many visions back then. You know, so friend, my question is, what is God asking of you today to let go so that you can grow to know Him deeper? You know, it could be really as simple as taking 30 minutes daily to be in His presence over perhaps gaming, scrolling TikTok, Netflix. <laughs> and if you're not feeling very motivated or maybe just a little lazy like me, then find a friend or buddy or someone who is spiritually more mature than you and do your quiet time together. You know, I want to encourage you that it's definitely worth it. Yes. All right, next. And for us to embrace God's calling, we also got to let go of self. So after God reveals himself to Moses, right, God began revealing the plans he had for him. So Exodus chapter 3, verse 7 to 12. All right, so verse 7, it says, Then the Lord said, I've clearly seen my people oppressed in Egypt. I've heard their cry of injustice because of their slave masters. I know about their pain. I've come down to rescue them from the Egyptians in order to take them out of that land and bring them to a good and broad land. A land that's full of milk and honey, a place where the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites all live, all right? And now the Israelites' cries of injustice have reached me. I've seen how much the Egyptians have oppressed them. So get going. I'm sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, who am I? You know, to go to Pharaoh to bring the 
Israelites out of Egypt. And then God said, I'll be with you. And this will show you that I'm the one who sent you. After you bring the people out of Egypt, you will come back here and worship God on this mountain. And also, I can imagine, you know, why Moses would feel inadequate. You know, he had spent 40 years running away from Pharaoh after murdering an Egyptian, right? So whether it was a mistake or not, you know, it doesn't matter because God still chose to use Moses. In fact, as you continue to read the rest of the chapter to chapter 4, you'll come to realize how gracious and compassionate our God is. You see, from the first time we read about God's call on Moses in verse 7 to the next chapter in verse 18, when Moses finally answered his calling, you know, (laughs) Moses kept giving God excuses on why he should not be the one to lead the Israelites. And I went to count, you know, in total, he had barked God five times. Oh, so let me bring out all the evidence. Okay, <laughs> Exodus chapter 3 verse 11, it says, But Moses said to God, Who am I to go to Pharaoh and to bring the Israelites out of Egypt? Exodus 3 13, But Moses said to God, If I now come to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your ancestors has sent me to you, they're going to ask me, What's this God's name? What am I supposed to say to them? Exodus 4 1, Then Moses replied, But what if they don't believe me or pay attention to me? They might say to me, the Lord didn't appear to you. Exodus 4.10 But Moses said to the Lord, My Lord, I've never been able to speak well. Not yesterday, not the day before, and certainly not now since you've been talking to your servant. I have a slow mouth and a thick tongue. (laughs) I'm sure many of us also have a thick tongue, don't (laughs) Exodus 4.13, the last part. But Moses said, please, my Lord, just send someone else. (laughs) Doesn't Moses' conversation sound familiar to us? You know, some of us here, you got to admit it, when God calls us, we, you know, we always go, but I'm too young, too old, too busy, not good enough. A lot of buts, right? No, but each time God responded to Moses' insecurities and love. Which brings me to the point that God's call isn't about you. It's about God using imperfect humans like us to make the world a better place. You know, oftentimes our ego gets in the way of us embracing God's call. You know, like Moses sometimes, you know, we fear that, you know, we will make mistakes and that will make us look stupid. You know, we care too much about what people think. You know, we constantly feel inadequate or unworthy because we set ourselves up for perfection. You see, the issue here isn't whether we are worthy of God's call in our lives. The question is, are we willing to let go of our ego and trust God? You see, our worthiness has nothing to do with us, but everything to do with the goodness of God. And can I push it further a little? And that is, don't let the feeling of inadequacy or, you know, the fear of making mistakes steal the joy of your calling. You know, so past two years, personally, you know, I struggled a lot with self-worth. For those of you who are close to me, you know. And, and, you know, I kept asking, you know, whether God has indeed called me to be a leader here in Tivo. So... Things has happened, there are incidents, you know, people who are very close to me left church, you know, and some were even upset with me, okay. <laughs> so I began really questioning, you know, I, I went to think deep, you know, if there, is there something wrong with me, you know? Thank you. <laughs> yes, all right. But before I knew it, you know, I, I felt drained, right? You know, instead of enjoying people's work, you know, being in the presence of people, you know, I started to withdraw and distance myself. Yeah, I felt the constant need to perform, you know, to prove that I'm worthy of the calling of a leader. You know, let me caveat here is that never once did pastor or the leaders told me that I had to do so. You know, all of this self-doubt talk were pressures that I had laid on myself. You know, and I started, you know, questioning God, you know, like, why is it so difficult to live in your calling God, you know? Like, wow, oh, it's a pain, okay? You know, but one day earlier this year, you know, I, was, I remember I was at downtown line. I was just, just trying on my way to God. Uh, on the way to church. <laughs> yes. I was traveling to church. 
but I was also having a conversation with God in my head, okay, <laughs> about what I could have done better, you know, I was asking God, you know, what could I have done better to prevent people from leaving church? You know what? And in that moment, I felt God speaking to me very, very clearly. And the words were, stop making it about you. You're not that important. Oh. <laughs> I was like, whoa, okay. You see, at that point of time, you know, I was expecting God to encourage, to sayang me. You know, but that wasn't the case. And it got me realized, it got me to realize that, hey, all this wow, you know, it was really about me. You know, oh, whoa, me, you know, feeling pitiful for myself. You know, and I had to stop and realize that it's not about performing or proving. It's about being and knowing that we are enough just the way we are. And all God wants of me is to be faithful, to respond to His call each time. To love and care for people and lead them closer to God. The results or outcome, outcome really didn't matter. So friend, I want to encourage you to move beyond the blessings today. You know, to know God personally in a deeper way. And don't let your ego, you know, hinder you from really living into your calling and enjoying it, all right? Stop butting God. Amen? <laughs> okay, because God's calling requires us to let go the things of this world and self. Okay, second point. Be comfortable that our faith is ever evolving. So fast forward, okay, Moses and the Israelites, they have successfully left Egypt and they are now on their way to the promised land. You know, but instead of taking 11 days to get there, they spent 40 years wandering the wilderness before eventually entering the promised land. You know, so we are not going to go into a discussion today about why 40 years, you know, when the journey itself only takes 11 days. That's a message for another day. But I want to talk about what the wilderness means for us. You see, for some of us, the wilderness could be a season of trial and testing, you know, where we go through difficult periods in our life that test our faith and faithfulness in God. For some, the wilderness is a place where we feel spiritually distant from God. You know, we are not sure where He is in our life. And perhaps, perhaps you know, we have more questions than answers to the Bible. You know, for some, the wilderness is a state of uncertainty. You know, it can feel like we are lost, just wandering about life with no clear direction, trying to figure out where God is leading. The wilderness will look different for all of us. And oftentimes, it's in the wilderness that we start to have questions about our faith, right? Questions like, why does God allow this to happen in my life? You know, where is God in my life? You know, where is God leading me next? Friend, it's okay to have questions. You know, it's okay to have doubts because God is not intimidated by your questions. As long as the heart behind the questions is to grow closer to God and not away from Him. You know, but sometimes if we are to be really honest with ourselves, we are not asking questions because we want to know God in a deeper way, to understand His plans for us. We are questioning because life isn't going the way we want and we are looking for someone or something to blame. Very harsh, right? Yes. So, I'm sure the Israelites had questions too, right? Like, God, why are we taking the longer route, you know? Why do you send us here in the wilderness to suffer? Yeah. You see, the Israelites, despite witnessing the miracles God performed in order to deliver them from Egypt, they started questioning, complaining, whining. To put it more bluntly, they started blaming God, their leaders, Moses, for bringing them out into the wilderness. All right? So let's take a look at Exodus chapter 16, verse 3. The Israelites said to them, Oh, how we wish that the Lord had just put us to death while we were still in the land of Egypt. There we could sit by the pots cooking meat and eat our fill of bread. Instead, you have brought us out into the desert to starve this whole assembly to death. Wow. Very, whew, huge accusation. Okay. <laughs> so you see, you know, when we are in the wilderness, it's easy to forget what God has done for us. 
You know, we forget the breakthroughs, the blessings in our life that wouldn't have been possible without God. And in the process of questioning our faith, you know, we fail to realize that God is actually closer than we think. Yes, the Israelites spent 40 years in the wilderness, but God was with them all the time. You see, God was leading the way with a pillar of cloud in the day and a fire at night. He even provided food for them in the form of manna that dropped from heaven. You know, Exodus 13, 21 to 22, it says, The Lord went in front of them during the day in a column of cloud to guide them, and at night in a column of lightning to give them light. This way they could travel during the day and at night. The column of cloud during the day and the column of lightning at night never left its place in front of the people. God was always there in front of them. Yes. Nehemiah 9.21 says, You kept them alive for 40 years. They lacked nothing in the wilderness. Their clothes didn't wear out and their feet didn't swell. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You see, on one hand, you know, while the Israelites were complaining, you know, about being in the wilderness, you know, Moses, he had, I'm sure he had his fair share of questions too, right? But instead, it was in the wilderness where Moses had the deepest encounter with God that grew his faith. You know, Exodus 33, 11 says, inside the tent of meeting, the Lord will speak to Moses face to face as one speaks to a friend. Wow. You see, what's the difference here? You know, I'm, I'm thinking to myself, you know, personally, it seems like that Moses grew to trust God beyond the blessings. You know, but the Israelites, you know, they stayed stagnant in their faith and their trust in God was dependent on the miracles and not who God was. So friend, if you feel like you're going through a season of wilderness in your life, you know, I want to encourage you by saying that it's okay. Because sometimes, you know, for our faith to grow and evolve, God will lead us into the wilderness. In fact, learn to see the wilderness as an opportunity for a deeper encounter with God, like Moses did. All right. Answering God's call requires us to constantly evolve in our faith. Because after all, it's a journey about knowing and growing closer to Him. And in the midst of the wilderness, you know, with all your questions, you know, what I found helpful is making a list of moments where God felt real and times when He had shown up for you in your life. You know, I think that list really helped me personally as I was navigating through the wilderness. Because that will help you remember why you follow God and realize how close He actually is in your life. Amen? All right, last point. We got to recognize that we are part of a bigger purpose. So figuring out God's calling for your life is important. You know, it will give you joy, fulfillment, purpose in your life, and that's great. But learn to hold it lightly too. You know, you see, when we become too fixated on the calling, you know, we latch on to a certain idea of what our calling should look like. You know, it becomes a goal, a destination, a target to hit. You know, God has called me to be successful in the workplace. Therefore, I must be this, this, this and that. All right. God has called me to lead people into His presence. Therefore, I must be on the worship team. And when life doesn't turn out the way we expect, we end up getting disappointed, discouraged. You know, I know you guys are not like that, but you get what I'm dri driving at, right? You see, friend, our calling is not a destination. You know, the ultimate purpose is to bring us closer to God and His community. You see, for Moses, he was someone who constantly wrestled with God's calling, being all just about himself. You see, when God first called him, you know, he responded, Who am I? I can't speak well. Send someone else. <laughs> You see, Moses, he had ego, like we all do. But God knew all along what Moses was capable of, the gifts in him. So each time, God would encourage Moses and redirect his attention to the bigger purpose of the community. That it was about delivering the Israelites from being oppressed in Egypt. You know, so friend, at this point, if you still have not caught on, 
God's calling is really not about you. <laughs> it's about God. It's about allowing God to transform us so that He can work through us to impact others, the community. So yes, while Moses did not enter the promised land, he continued to obey God by raising up Joshua to be the new leader to teach God's commandment to the Israelites. The calling wasn't about him. It was bigger than that. It was about the community. So I want to encourage you today, you know, even as we pray, don't let the focus be, who am I? You know, but rather redirect the attention to what is God asking of me for the community? Amen? And for some of us, if you feel like you are in some sort of wilderness, you know, I just want to encourage you, don't give up. You know, know that God is closer than you think and that you have a community here that will ride through the ups and downs with you. You are not on your own. Maybe you're not used to asking for help, but I want to encourage you, you know, share with a friend or two about what you're going through and ask them to pray for you because you'll be surprised by how that simple act can make you feel a whole lot less lonely in this journey. Amen.